you know, recently the Indian Navy allowed officers and sailors to wear kurta pajama in officers' mess and sailors' institutes, right? Now, in a move to promote what they're saying is Indian traditions and Indianizing the so-called military customs or uniforms that could be colonial in their nature, right? Now, so for those of you who might not know this, what an officer, Army, Navy or Air Force wears or not is under strict guidelines, formal wear, casual wear, what you wear in the mess, what you wear when you're hosting, etc. It's strictly marked and details have been put out and everybody, including their families, has to follow. And thus, the new code of allowing kurta pajama for men and women is a significant one. But this entire sort of Indianization of the Indian Navy dress code got us thinking about uh, what is the history of kurta pajama itself, its heritage, its evolution as well. And while researching for this story, we thought who better than Tarun Tehliani to talk about it. Now, over the past three decades, Tarun has been galvanizing Indian fashion towards celebrating Indian history, Indian legacy as well. He's dressed even Lady Gaga in his lovely drapes. So without any further ado, let me just welcome the man himself. Hi, Tarun. Welcome to TVC. How are you doing this morning? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks for having me here. It's nice to be here. Yeah, lovely to have you as well. Uh, that bit early in the day, I guess, but I think we just had to talk about it. And we thought of you, I'll tell you specifically why, when it came to the Indian Navy new dress code, is because we know that your father was in the Navy. So you have a bit of a personal story attached to how the uniform has evolved over the past few decades. And now finally, uh, the Navy embracing kurta pajama as well. Talk to us a little bit about what you thought of the move and also about kurta pajama itself, uh, what has been the story behind it? Well, it's very funny that you should ask me because one of my big fights with my father for the last few years he was alive was he'd always have these dinners at the mess, you know. Ex-naval admirals always want to entertain in the mess. They're deeply attached to anything naval. And he'd always ring me and say, remember yeah. that you can't wear a kurta pajama or a churidar. And I'd say, why? Why can't I wear it? What's this colonial buck buck? And he'd say, now stop it, stop it. And I'd say, what's your wife wearing? And he'd say, a sari. <laughs> so I said, would you like me to come in a sari? Why can't they wear Indian clothes? And why can't we men wear it? So it's funny that you should ask me ah. this. Because this went back and forth. <laughs> Every dinner he'd ring me and say, just remember, you can't wear it. And I'd say, what if Chidambaram came in? Or what if some politician came in? Are you going to yank them off and have a double huh. standard for it? So I did actually argue with him <laughs> a lot that this was terribly colonial. And yeah. even the new mess, you mm. know, there was a big uh, naval mess here by Delhi Airport called Varuna. And I said, even when you build new things, you can't keep following the old, uh, you know, systems laid down by the British. That was a different time. I mean, we're now 2000 plus. But having said that, mm. when I did think about everyone showing up at the mess in Churidar Kurtas, I think if it's just a civilian kind of dinner where, uh, well, not, I don't mean civilian, but it's certainly casual. But I think there's something to be said for military uniform when they have formal, uh, you know, dinners or, you know, occasions. Because they wear medals, there's a structure to uniforms. And so I think when it's mm, off duty mm, or it's mm. more casual, it's totally fine to wear churidar kurtas. But I think that at ceremonial and formal things, I think that uniform signifies rank and rank in the army or navy or air force is extremely important because there's That's a structure true. to responsibility yeah. command and so on and so forth and i don't think that can be substituted yeah. yeah and we've got some lovely pictures of your father actually uh in that uniform but tarun when we were oh, really? having this conversation i yeah. i remember thinking about yeah we've got all those pictures playing up as well but uh i wanted to talk a little bit about where this humble kurta pajama actually comes from. We again did some research, your team and our team sort of got together to understand the journey that kurta pajama has actually made over the past few decades, if not, you know, centuries. And they, we see it going from well, it's actually, uh, it's actually a frills. story over centuries. I obviously centuries. understand little about it. So I'll leave it to you to explain. Yeah, I'll leave it to you to explain what this journey has been. Well, you know, I'm not sure how much of this is actually accurately documented. And unfortunately, in this part of the world, our painting tradition was in the miniature form. 
So it was not realistic like in Europe where, you know, you can see the different fo uh, fashions through different centuries. But basically, in this part of the world, we wore the draped fabric, right? And it was lovely textiles at the lower body, upper body. The sari is still a form of that. And I think from what we know, it's the kurta is derived from the Persian word kurtaka, which means a tunic. Uh, there are different tribes that came down in the second century and third century and brought in this basic tunic and with the slits on the side. At that time, clothing was very basic and functional. And we had just made the switch mm. from just wearing textiles draped around the body into this is the first bit of stitching that came into this part of the world through the Persians, from what we understand. And so it's evolved from there. Mm. Mm. And I think it's sort of become, you know, in my lifetime, I've seen women wanting to give up the sari to wear a kurta on a day to day because their lives are very different, right? My grandmother sat at home, so she was mm, fine in a sari. Mm, mm, mm. But everybody today wants to wear a kurta to work, if not jeans or a pair of pants, because it just makes running around much easier, you know, movement easier. You don't yeah. have to manage so much fabric. Wash and laundry, as people live in tiny apartments, is much easier with a simple piece of, mm. a, a straight piece of fabric. So mm. I think that as society has moved and movement and roles of people have changed, Clothing becomes closer to the body, more streamlined. It has stretched. There's more tailoring. And as we get used to that, the kurta has naturally had its own evolution. Yeah. And even if you see the kurta pajama, the humble kurta pajama now, it seems to be having its own moment. You do a lot of menswear as well. And that's where we see sort of the drapes coming back. The... F uh, I mean, some of the skirting coming back to the kurta pajama. So, you know, Can like you talk I said, to us about how it's going now? Yeah, so, you know, like I talked about how, you know, we went from just draping fabric into some kind of tailoring. Now that we have these tailoring techniques at our command, because we, present, we basically learned tailoring from the English. And in the last 30, 40 years, since the government of India has set up NIFs and technical institutes, and brought in technology of construction, a lot of Indian kids have mm -hmm. studied it and they've fanned out and spread this knowledge. And also there's been a huge export industry out of India that learned tailoring to cater to the Western world. All this has poured into our mm. own uh, national dress form, like if you say, from a choli to a corset to the kurta, everything's had many moments. So now you have multiple things. Basically different regions and different empires had different kinds of styles. So in North India, it was much straighter. The Pakistanis or let's say, you know, the Afghans to Rajasthan wore more overlap things with ties. You had the Angarkha. These were all different forms of the Kurta. Obviously in Mughal courts, they dressed them up. You know, chicken curry was done all over in the North. In the South, however, they stayed more to shorter tunics. It didn't become such a big thing in the South. But now post-independence, mm. as we know, and with the effects of Bollywood and lifestyles becoming similar, fashion travels ceaselessly mm. up and down the country. So you'll see a lot of women in Chennai, for instance, yeah. wearing a kurta, which probably 20, 30 years back you wouldn't have. The shalwar kameez has become, you know, the Indian staple till they switch to Western clothes or they wear mm. the kurti with trousers, which I must give credit to the Indian designer Monisha Jai Singh, who really made it a big fashion thing, you know, 20, 30 years back. And it's become one of her staples, the dressy kurti that you wear with trousers. And it worked very well abroad in summer, mm. even in Western worlds, in holiday and resort. You know, you're in the Hamptons, you're here, there, you, mm. you wear a kurti and Lucknow chicken houses. So it's an easy garment. It's been interpreted in many ways. And now you have designers mm. like myself and many others playing with different cuts. So it makes it exciting and modern. Uh, whether you touch the yeah. drape, you do yeah. the princess line, you do different kinds of pleats. And it's very exciting actually because it's mm. nice. It works in our culture. It works in our climate. You know, you do it in the softer cottons. We're not in a climate. It's nice here right now in winter. But when it's warm and hot and humid, mm. Mm. to wear mm. a natural cotton with a little style is so much nicer. And therefore, we must always work That's with true. what works That's for true, our climate and our culture, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but Tarun, it's interesting how you said that it's not just India that's sort of uh, embracing our fabrics, our cuts, our designs. Indian fabrics, Indian designers are having such a moment even globally. 
where do you see this trend really going? I mean, I can refer to, we've got Lady Gaga dressed in a sari, you draped her as well. Tell me, where do you see this uh, trend moving forward, this massive moment that Indian fabrics, textiles, embroidery is actually having globally? Well, do you know, I think this is kind of India's moment at many levels. I mean, not just fashion, but I mm. think India on the global stage right now seems to be commanding a very different position than she was even 10, 15 years back as a summation of multiple things, you know, uh, political, economic, what is, what, what's happened post uh, the pandemic. True. Hmm. And of course, you, we all know that Bollywood's been a huge influence of carrying the culture. The Indian wedding is now a global phenomena. I mean, there was a pre-wedding last week and, <laughs> you know, it's made news around the world. We'll so talk about that in a moment. Naturally, through yeah, this, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, Ivanka Trump is here in, you know, Alenga. So, I think that these things that might have seemed very alien start to look familiar, and then not mm. start don't mm. look so much like costume. I mean, it's not like people are going to dress like this abroad. They get very intimidated by these clothes. But the simpler things are not of India, and the fact that we have all this mm. wonderful craft that we still need to give people employment to do beautiful things by hand. That's a rarity in today's world. Mm. And therefore, combined with Indian textiles mm. and the technology of manufacturing clothes now to international global standards of fit and finish, I think is having a huge impact mm. on the global scene. I still think it's small. We're still bigger exporters than mm. we are original mm. designers to the West. But you know what? We have a huge market to dress in India with just Indians, Pakistanis, South Asia and the Indian diaspora. We haven't done them fully yet, but yeah. it's a nice process of osmosis that's going out at the moment. Mm. Yeah, I like how you've mentioned that in the history that you've mentioned in your book as well. We were going through that uh, while sort of prepping up for this segment. But you talked about the pre-wedding and how can we not then mention how Radhika Merchant walked in. That entire video was quite beautiful. She walks in with this really lovely Bollywood song and she's wearing that ensemble that you put together for her. Tell us a little bit about that particular outfit and how engaged was Radhika in the process? What were you guys thinking? What was, uh, what was the inspiration was there behind that Radhika was extremely engaged and the lovely thing about her was that for a change, here was a bride who just wanted to be true to her own aesthetic. She likes very fine things, very delicate, mm. no big stones. It was not for anyone else's benefit, but what made her comfortable. And there was a naturalness and a softness, I think, that's reverberated around the world uh, of the way this girl came out and looked, you know. You could see the emotion, mm. there was no clutter, she had one beautiful necklace. And I think she's made a huge style statement and, and not to make a style statement, she was just being true to herself. And I think she had the benefit of a very good mm. stylist in Riyadh Kapoor, who basically helped her, you know, uh, and it was draped and we worked in traditional textiles. But you know what I mean when I talked earlier about a modern cut and fit. So there was no excess, it had a softness. Mm. And Radhika was true to that. And I hope she, and I'm sure like, she will like continue to... Like very delicate, to it, it just, kind of it's just the word, yeah. Yeah, it is. It, you know, you refer to something called Khashida, mm. where we basically paint the motifs. You know, in embroidery, you can either fill it fully in thread <clears throat> or you paint mm. everything so you get the colors and then you embroider more delicately. I think for a long while in the 90s mm. or early 2000s, this 3D thing, Zardozi work, sort of became a, a kind of symbol of wealth and status, you know, because it just looks so heavy. But it had reached mm. a point where brides couldn't move, clothes weighed 30 kilos, things were tearing on them. I mean, it was ridiculous. I mean, this is what you put on an elephant, you know, on a chadar. You don't put on a human body. And not today's delicate, uh, <laughs> petite brides. So I've always liked this very flat work. So you can tell a story, you can have all the color. Mm. But if Indian fabric loses its drape, I think the most beautiful thing in this country is the way we drape fabric on ourselves. And so... What you can do now after years of experimenting is to combine the two so you have the softness, you have the embroidery, but it doesn't lose its drape. And I think that's what we did. So for instance, yeah. here, I'm going to hold a page up from the book mm. where we went to the kumb, and here we have the sadhu with his drapes. And we did a contemporary dress 
based on the drape. And for me, to take the structured drape that has been a part of Indian culture and to make it in a structured form, so a plain drape, because today no one, you know, young girls feel a little intimidated going out in a sari for eight hours because they have 20 pins in them. So we structure it, we build it into the design. And I think that's the exciting new thing combined with Indian embroidery and craft, which is fantastic, the best in the world. That's true. I mean, there's nothing comparable to it. So I think it's the moment. You're right, you're right. It is quite a moment uh, for Indian fabrics, textile design, for craftsmen, all of it. But before we let you go, Tarun, I have to ask you, you've dressed up the who's and who of the world. Uh, which one of the celebrities perhaps has been uh, your favorite or let me spice it up a little bit. Which one do you think has been the toughest to please and implement? The one which came with a really massive brief and you had to put it all together. You know, it's not that anyone's tough. Actually, they're quite, uh, most people are quite sweet today. And I think more and more today, compared to 10, 15 years back, they know what they want. They have a sense of self and the world celebrates it. The mm. problem is if someone doesn't know what they want, more with brides, and they're trying to make 10 people happy or a notion of what they should be if it's, you know, uh, not themselves. Always, I always tell people, find yourself. This is an expression of yourself. Don't be someone else because it's never going mm. to work. Now, obviously, if you have a beautiful girl, but names, you know, you know, give us the, names. The, the celebrities. Ah, I'm too clever and too long in the tooth to single people out. <laughs> Let's say we've had the pleasure of dressing many beautiful people and we've had a muse, Minal Modi, Lalit Modi's wife, who was a real style influence for the studio. And, you know, her brief when mm. she came to see me was, I want to look like I'm wrapped in a turban. Now, what do you make of that? But that's when we started the draping story. Mm. And so it's always be remembered. In fact, there's mm. a photo in the book of her where she said, I want to look like I'm wrapped in a turban. How gorgeous is that? I'm not going to get any names from you. Somebody in the current lot, any Gen Z. I mean, you know, we dress all of them all the time, but very often they just take things. We, our just recent big wedding was Rakul Preet, you know, and she was easy and beautiful mm. and wanted lightness. I think that time has moved. You know, if someone, once a lady came to me and she described an outfit and I said, you're describing Sunit Varma. So I dialed him and said, here, you need to go here for an appointment. I think we're all quite clear now. We do what we do <laughs> and it works better for all concerned if we all stay true to our own style and aesthetic. That's lovely. Well, Tarun, thank you so much. Sorry, I haven't had such a bad experience of, yet. We started with My Kurtas. My pleasure. Thank you so much and yep. congratulations on the new book as well. It looks lovely and we can't wait to see more of it. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. It's called A Journey to India Modern. Indeed, and it is thank one. Thank you. And that's why... That's why we chose such an apt topic as well for it. Thanks so much, Tarun, for joining us here on TBC.